Nostalgia, and another edition of Ham and Egg News, where we react to Ken Ham reacting to things. If you're new to the channel, take a second to tap on the subscribe button so that you'll be notified when new science, theology, and news videos come out. The Answers in Genesis Ark Encounter and Creation Museum officially reopened this week after Kentucky lifted COVID restrictions. We're here for the reopening of the Ark after three months of shutdown because of the COVID-19 situation. And so it's not like it's uh, massive uh, crowds or anything like that. I'm sure we'll talk more about that as the days pass. But today, I want to look at this non-Ken episode. Recently, Answers News returned to its twice-a-week format, which was a touch surprising until Ken announced a paid streaming service called Answers TV. Our uh, most exciting thing, of course, is this new Answers TV platform and it's giving us a way to get out a lot of the programs that we've produced to you. Between Facebook and YouTube, I don't think you were struggling with ways to get your program out to your audience. What you were lacking was a way to get your programs out there and get paid for it. A year subscription is only just over $3. I'll be keeping an eye on Answers TV as well. But for today's purposes, the relevant factor is that when people are paying for a streaming service, they expect the regular edition of new content. I'm looking at you, Disney+. Plus. And so, Expanded Answers New Schedule has meant expanding the cast as well. The A-team, the B-team, and a new C-team rotation, which includes one Tim Chafee. I'm Roger Patterson, and I'm joined today by Tim Chafee back here in the back and Dr. Jennifer Rivera. If you've been watching my channel for a while, you might remember Tim from my Risen Without a Doubt video and a few others. He's the content manager for the Ark and Creation Museum, which means he wrote most of the signs. A bigger job than it sounds like, since these attractions are mostly signs. Tim and I have had some friendly exchanges in the past, and this spring I attended his online class about the resurrection. We even bonded a little over esoteric Canadian sitcoms. Paul, have you watched every episode of Corner Gas? <laughs> I'm gonna the answer is yes, then I know that you are a true Canadian. <laughs> oh, what did he say? <laughs> you can oh. tell me that your dog ran away. <laughs> Perfect. That's the opening line to the song. <laughs> Classic. Oh, that show is hilarious. He's definitely from Canada. That's great. As creation apologists go, Tim seems to be a good guy. A smart guy. A knowledgeable guy with some good takes. Well, you know, some Christians like to leave tracks when, you know, as a tip. Well, I wouldn't, let me encourage you not to do that, at, not to do that just by itself. But at the end of the day... He's still shaping the usual harmful Answers in Genesis narrative. Uh, homosexuality, a lot of times people are, if somebody comes out, they're talking about how brave they are, how heroic they are, and yet everybody's praising them. Why is that brave if, if people are praising you all the time for doing that? Well, actually, from a biblical point of view, we've gotten a lot worse. We're, our, we used to live a lot longer, and we've, dr we've decreased about tenfold because of our sin. We haven't even been here for 9,000 years. <laughs> so Now, Tim is uniquely vocal about a particular argument for the resurrection of Jesus called the Nazareth Inscription. So this article was right up his alley. So our next article is Nazareth tablet has nothing to do with Jesus, uh, belong to a Greek tyrant scientist says. Yeah, so the Nazareth Inscription was something that was uh, uncovered, at least came to light in 1878. And the, the person who owned it had a little note on it and he just said, sent from Nazareth. And so it's always been called the Nazareth Inscription. As you were talking about the inscription on there, it's, a, it's an imperial rescript. So it's a summary of a law from, from one of the emperors. And um, what it talks about is that it's the death penalty for anybody who would um, move a body from a tomb with wicked intent. It's not about normal grave robbing, like stealing the valuables or anything. It's about actually moving the body out of there. And um, for a long time, people have wondered, is this about, is it in response to Jesus because of the, uh, what's going on in the empire is the disciples go and they preach the gospel throughout, you know, what's happening in all these different cities. You get <laughs> riots are starting up and, and the emperor says, that's enough. Nope, this is illegal. You can't do that. And so uh, many people have thought it's been written by Claudius, who would have been in the 40s, um, and in response to the early preaching of the resurrection. So what this study did, uh, they, they took a look at the marble tablet itself, which is in France, and they were able to scrape a tiny little bit of it off the back. They got permission to do that, and they did a chemical analysis, and they found out that the marble came from the island of Kos, which is just off the southwestern coast of Turkey. And uh, they, they've got marble quarries there. And then, so they, they discovered where it most likely came from, which that's, that's yeah. good science. And, and from a scientific perspective, we can agree that the chemical analysis mm -hmm. showing, so marble's basically a calcium carbonate 
uh, it's known as calcite by geologists, and it's got different particles in it like mica and quartz and pyrite and other things that have distinct chemical signatures, and different marble deposits have those different chemical makeups and composition. So we can agree from an operational side that we've got a correct analysis of this of this sample, and then we can line that up with these other with this rock from this quarry and say, yeah, it probably came from there. But then we run into other assumptions. Right, then the researchers say, well, they, they looked at some of the history and they realized, oh, there was a tyrant on the island of Kos named Nicias. And after he died uh, around 20 BC, his tomb was, was um, disrupted. They, they dragged his body out and it was because the citizens didn't like him, apparently. There's not a whole lot known about Nicias, but uh, just on a few, some of the writings, you know, a few uh, small inscriptions, they're, they're able to make this determination. So they think here is, this is probably what it's about. In fact, the, the study goes a little further than just saying probably they, that we can disregard the Nazareth idea. They even say things like, well, the only reason it was connected to Jesus is because it was allegedly found in Nazareth. In 1980, Bruce Metzger, one of the most influential Bible scholars of the 20th century, and an authority multiply referenced by Answers in Genesis, had this to say. One should observe that the note does not say discovered at Nazareth, but sent from Nazareth. Whether the marble slab had been erected originally at Nazareth, or had been brought there in modern times, is quite unknown. In the 1870s, Nazareth, like Jerusalem, was a natural market for dealers in antiquities. None of the antiquity scholars on this topic are so bold as to insist it was discovered in Nazareth. This Journal of Bible Literature paper affirms use of the title Nazareth in the catalog of the Froner collection, where the inscription reposed until 1925, means nothing more than that Nazareth was a shipping center. And these are the Christian sources. But now we know it's from Kos. Well, pump the brakes a little bit here, <laughs> because... Yeah. If there, there's a lot of things, all of the marble in Israel is imported. They don't have any local sources. So if you find marble in Israel, you can assume that it's been imported. The material isn't from there. And all things being equal, that doesn't tell us if the markings on the material were made before or after the material arrived. They also misrepresent the tablet's importance, you know, the reason why it's connected to Christianity. It's not because it was found in Nazareth. Yeah. If the inscription is connected to Jesus... It makes no sense to be found in the small town where he's from, rather than near the large city of Jerusalem where the alleged grave robbery actually took place. The people of Nazareth didn't have a body-snatching problem. It's because of what it says. You're right, Tim. So let's take a minute to consider what it says. Essentially, as ordered by an otherwise unidentified Caesar, anyone who moves an entombed body with malicious intent should be put to death. Now, let's consider the relevant story details from the Gospel of Matthew, the only one that speaks to grave robbery. In Matthew 27, chief priests and Pharisees ask Roman official Pilate to protect Jesus' tomb from grave robbers. So, the stone over his grave is sealed and a guard is posted. In the following chapter, the Jewish leaders bribe the guards to spread a lie that the disciples stole the body. If we accept the implausible scenario that the Roman guards went to the Jewish leaders before their Roman superiors, then we are in a world where Roman leadership thinks that an officially sealed and guarded tomb wasn't enough signal of state disapproval to prevent thieving apostles, but that this defiant behavior could somehow have been thwarted with an additional decree. Listen, sure... Overpowering guards and breaking an official seal was already illegal. But the disciples would never do anything double illegal, would they? Alternately, the guard superiors were aware that they were spreading a false story, yet still decided to take time to pass a law to prevent an action that they knew full well didn't happen in the first place. None of this makes any sense in connection to Jesus. The Nazareth description talks about sealing stones, which are for sepulchers, and those are only found in Israel. So it seems like it's identifying something that happened in Israel, not something on coast. Yes. The most likely answer is that neither Jesus nor Nicias were the inspiration for this. There are endless reasons one could speculate as to why an unnamed Caesar at an unknown place, and ultimately an unknown time, after all, this could be a copy of an earlier edict, might want to discourage moving dead bodies. You know what, even if, and I think that's the most important takeaway, even if the Nazareth inscription wasn't written in response to, you know, what happened with Jesus, that doesn't disprove the resurrection. This is true, if only in the sense that nothing in ancient history is ever proven or disproven. Historians speak of probabilities, what likely happened or what might have happened. 
What we can say is that whatever slight reference the Nazarene inscription may have had on the historical veracity of the resurrection, this new study reduces that further. When it comes to the probability that Jesus rose from the dead, I've got a whole playlist that you might be interested in. Looking at it from all angles, attempting to find that line between legend and truth. In fact, it's on the screen waiting for you to tap on it right now. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, later.